Hi, I'm Kevin. Welcome to my cave. Last time, we got started on designing the triangle wave core for an actual voltage-controlled oscillator based on the core oscillator of the Bukla 259. I'd recommend you watch that video so you'll have a clue what it is we're building. We got as far as having the complete schematic in KeyCAD. This time, we'll get down to building and testing it, so let's get right to it. I like having the frequency control pot out of the way, so I'll put it here on the left. Next comes the voltage reference and the output transistor, along with the associated resistors. And I need the capacitors on the power rails and the TL431's cathode. Building it this far brings me to a place where I can do a test. I'll hook up a 1K resistor on the output of the current sink. I'll bring out my micro ammeter, connect the other end of the resistor to the plus 12 power rail through the meter, and power it up. When I twist the knob, it shows me a range of about 10 to 308 microamps, which is nowhere near what I expected. I have to have a goof somewhere. Yeah, I forgot to put in one power jumper. Let me try that again. From about 3 microamps to over 500. That's more like what I expected. Okay, let's move on to the switch. I'll add the two transistors. Put on a sticky note so I don't lose track of which one is which. Jumper both emitters to the current sink. And add the voltage divider on Q1. This is now another opportunity to test things out. I'll connect microammeters to the two outputs, with the other end going to plus 12 with a 1K resistor. And I'll add a switch so that I can put either plus 5 or ground to the base of Q5, with my fluff 5 supply coming in through another pair of test leads. And I didn't hit record when I ran the first test. The switch didn't work at all. I thought I'd somehow managed once again to disconnect a power connection on the current sink. And then, after about an hour of poking and measuring voltages at practically every point in the circuit, I realized what was wrong. I'd incorrectly drawn the schematic with the current sink returned to ground rather than the minus 12 volt supply. And of course I wired what I drew. It worked fine with the current sink in isolation, but it couldn't pull the transistor emitters low enough for the switch to work. Oops. Okay, so I've moved those wires to the minus 12 volt rail. With the logic input at ground, I see that the left hand meter will read as much as 640 microamps and as little as 3.7. Pretty close to what I wanted. The right-hand meter shows next to no current. Its zero adjustment is about 200 nanoamps off. If I change the logic input to plus 5 volts, the right-hand meter shows from 3.9 microamps again up to about 640. The switch now appears to be working. Next, I'll wire up the current mirror made of one discrete transistor and a matched pair. You know, blue tape doesn't stick all that well to a silicone pad. This is actually another good opportunity to test. This time I'll put my microammeter between the mirror's output and ground, and connect the same switch arrangement as in the previous test.
At logic high, it can pull down to about negative 335 microamps, less than the 640. But that's because I've made another mistake. When I placed the transistor Q2 in the schematic, I'd had another brain fault and put its emitter to the bottom rather than the top. I'm not doing very well at this just at the moment, am I? I can't be bothered to model how the circuit will behave with Q2 in the reverse active mode. I'll just say, fix the wiring and retest. And it worked. The output current swung between negative 638 and positive 633 microamps when I split the switch. But the video file on my camera wasn't readable. I'm not having a good day today. I'll go on to wire the integrator, the divider for its plus input, and its timing capacitor. Then, with all the silly things I'd done, I decided to take a break. That's when I tried to copy the files off the camera and found that the demonstration of the current mirror was damaged. So I hooked up my switch again and threw it both ways to show that I didn't lie to you about being able to get close to the 640 microamps that I promised in both directions. And now the only remaining active element is the comparator. As I was wiring it, I found yet another schematic error. I hadn't filled in the correct value for the pull-down resistor on its output. I penciled that into the paper schematic I was working from at the bench. I also found that I had the capacitor on the comparator's plus input drawn wrong and penciled that in as well. Hopefully that's all the mistakes taken care of. Here's the modified circuit. I'll try powering it on. Wow, that looks like a near-perfect 5-volt triangle wave. The scope says the square wave is just over 55 Hz, which is the A below the base staff, and it says that the duty cycle of the square wave is just about exactly 50%. I'll try a few more frequencies, 
moving up by about an octave each time. About 110 hertz still looks nearly perfect. Ditto to 20 hertz. And likewise a 440. A880, the A above the treble staff, the square wave is starting to roll off a little. The high notes are hard to tune, so I'll just go with some random frequencies. About 1800 hertz, the roll-off is more pronounced, and the symmetry is starting to drift slightly, although it's still within a percent. What the heck, let's slam it all the way to the maximum frequency, 9.1 kilohertz. That roll-off is really bad, and now there's a 4% error in the symmetry. I'm pretty sure that the comparator is driving more capacitance than I planned for. But how much capacitance is that? Let me zoom in on just the leading edge of that square wave and set some cursors. If we feed an RC circuit with a step function, the rule of thumb is that the voltage will reach 63% of the way from the starting voltage to the ending voltage in one RC time constant. We're starting from a voltage of 160 millivolts, and we already computed our ending voltage as 4.14 volts. The measured 4.04 is close enough. So we want to know how long it takes to rise 63% of the difference between those two values, or 2.4 volts. It took us two microseconds to get that far. So the measured capacitance is that number divided by the output impedance of the comparator, or about 71 picofarads. Can I believe that number? It was at this point that I finally realized that the deglitching capacitor was miswired in the schematic. As shown, it would do almost exactly nothing, and when I pulled it out, nothing observable happened on the scope. Okay, I'll remember that. So where is all that capacitance? The base of the transistor in the switch will have an input capacitance of about 5 picofarads. My scope probe will be another 12. The input capacitance of the comparator will be another 5 or so, and each column of the breadboard is maybe 6 picofarads more. The signal is going at a relatively low impedance, too. I count 7 columns. I didn't think it would be quite that bad. Back of the envelope is 62 picofarads, not far from the 71 that we calculated. Time to cut those resistors by the factor of 10 that I mentioned earlier. Sure enough, when I try it out with the smaller resistors, I get a clean square wave as well as a clean triangle. What's more, I happen to notice that the high-end frequency has gone up from 9.1 kHz to 9.43. That's interesting, because analog synthesizer VCOs have a reputation for going flat at the high-pitched end and there has been a lot of discussion about how to compensate for that. When I zoom in on the transitions, they also look cleaner. The rise time has improved by the expected factor of 10, from 2 microseconds to 200 nanoseconds. I'm happy with that. That leaves me with the question of why Buchla needed the deglitching capacitor in the first place. I'm going to guess that on a properly built PCB, the stray reactances would be much smaller, and perhaps the circuit would be unstable. So what I'll do is mark the capacitor in the schematic as not fitted, so that when I get around to having a PCB made, I will remember to leave pads for it. That way I can put it back later if I need it. This long debugging session has left me with a ton of handwritten changes to the schematic. Let me get those back into KiCad and get them up on the project GitHub for you. I'm pretty confident that the top half of the schematic is now a workable triangle core. So let's take a look at what still has to happen before this circuit becomes something that I want to make into a module. 
The big thing is that it needs volt per octave control so that a keyboard or sequencer can make a melody on it. It also needs to output a greater variety of waveforms. Generally, VCOs will offer sawtooth, sine wave, and pulse outputs, with the pulse outputs having a variable duty cycle. I'd like to have frequency modulation on it, both linear and exponential. That will be essential for things like vibrato and for more complex sounds as well. Even more interesting sounds can be made with a technique called through zero frequency modulation, and I'll take that up in a later episode. I might leave that part out in the first version. I want the ability to have this oscillator run in a harmonic relationship with another one, so I need it to have a sync input. Finally, a synthesizer also needs low frequency oscillators to serve as clocks, vibrato generators, amplitude modulation sources, and so on. There doesn't seem to be any obvious reason that I couldn't build a low frequency version of this core, although the low frequency design has another set of considerations that I won't get into just yet. All of these features are essentially bells and whistles that can be added around this basic core, so I think I have a solid platform for the next few episodes in this series. Next time, though, I want to get started with a little series on op-amp basics, since some viewers have asked questions about some fairly simple op-amp circuits. I also want to go back to the series on transistor theory and start discussing a new topic there, the differential pair. So I hope you'll stay tuned for all these topics, and perhaps favor me with a subscription. In the meantime, stay safe, stay healthy, stay curious, and take care of one another. Bye!